I'm Dr. Mark Goulston. I'm a medical doctor and psychiatrist. And what I'm most known for is books that I've written. One of them is called Just Listen. It became the top book on listening in the world. Recently, a site called Most Recommended Books um, named it as the fourth uh, best communication skills book of all time out of 15 books. And But what I'm most proud of, and not as widely known, but I would like to be, is that while I was practicing as a psychiatrist, one of my focuses was suicide prevention. And in 30 years, none of my patients died by suicide. Dr. Mark Golston, welcome to the Make It Podcast. So glad to be here. Thank you. Anytime. And to give this audience a deeper sense of your accomplishments and who you are to contextualize it a little bit more, I'm going to read from a bio. And as I always say, this is the internet. So feel free to amend to this reading if you find that anything is inaccurate. Dr. Mark Golston is a Marshall Goldsmith, 100 Coaches member and Coaches Entrepreneurs, CEOs, chairs, and managing directors to become the best version of themselves. He is also an international keynote speaker, helping audiences do the same. Originally a UCLA professor of psychiatry for over 25 years and a former FBI and police hostage negotiation trainer, Dr. Mark Golston's expertise has been forged and proven in the crucible of real life, high stakes situations. He is the author or co-author of nine books with his book, Just Listen, being translated into 28 languages. He is the host of the highly rated podcast, My Wake Up Call. Great podcast, by the way. Listen to it uh, for sure. And the host of Out of Our Minds and In Your Space on Twitter Spaces, which is a mashup for creatives and thinkers. Mark is also on the power list of the top 200 biggest voices in leadership to watch for in 2022. Dr. Golson, I'd love to uh, start this conversation. Could be a challenging first question, I'll say that, but I do want to start at the beginning with you and ask who is Dr. Ed Schneidman? And what does he mean to you? Dr. Ed Schneidman was a pioneer in the study and practice of suicide prevention. He was at UCLA, and he co-founded the Suicide Prevention Centers in Washington and Los Angeles. And he was one of my supervisors and then a mentor. And Uh, One of my focuses in my practice, as I mentioned, was suicide prevention, and he was one of my main referral sources. So frequently what would happen is he would uh, be asked to do a consultation up on the inpatient wards when someone needed to be discharged who was still suicidal but not acutely suicidal. In -hmm. those days, you could be in the hospital for a month or six weeks. It's much different now. And uh, he would sometimes be asked to meet with a young man or a young woman who was still suicidal, but not acutely, and you can't keep them there forever. So he would meet with them, and he would call me or page me, and it was always the same call. He'd say, Mark, this is Ed. I'm here with this handsome young man. I'm here with this lovely young woman. They're in a lot of pain, Mark. You could help them see them. And then he'd put them on the phone, and then they could be discharged because someone needed to follow up with them. And some of these patients, the inpatient psychiatrists didn't want to see as outpatients because they made them nervous. And one of the greatest discoveries, which was a fortunate accident in my career, is Following my training, I was supposed to go into a fellowship, and the fellowship fell through at the last minute. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll just go out and see if anybody shows up, see if uh, I can have a practice. And I had this referral source, Dr. Schneidman. 
And why it was a fortunate accident uh, is because since I was in practice, when I would meet with highly depressed or anxious or suicidal patients, I learned to listen into their eyes and what their eyes were screaming out at me, not their voices, but their eyes were, you're checking boxes and I'm running out of time. Mm -hmm. Checking boxes meaning, you know, you follow a protocol. And I feel badly for today's mental health practitioners because they're all checking boxes. Sometimes they're typing on their electronic record keeping to make sure that they've that they got the right code, the right diagnosis, the right whatever. And, <clears throat> and, but when they looked at me that way, I had the option of uh, letting go of the boxes and seeing where their eyes took me. Yeah. And I learned to listen into people's eyes and what I'm trying to teach the world because we are in a mental health crisis, if there's anyone that you're worried about in your life, if you look into their eyes, uh, and one of the things that Dr. Schneidman taught me is to look into people's eyes and say, what hurts? What hurts most? What's the hurt that doesn't seem to end? Yeah. What's the hurt that sometimes makes you want to do destructive things to make it go away? Not you don't rattle them off. You're listening in a conversation. But what happens is I learn to listen exclusively for hurt, fear, anger, and how much time before they did something destructive. In fact, I focus so closely on that. Sometimes I didn't even know what gender or race I was speaking to. I remember there was one patient, we were meeting for about six months, and, and I said something, uh, I don't think it was racist, but I said something, and he said, Dr. Goulston, I'm black. <laughs> I said, what? He said, I'm black, and I hadn't noticed it. Oh, wow. Do you follow what I'm saying? And so, and I so, do, I do. And I've yeah. given a name to this process, and I've named it in one of my uh, one of my recent co-authored books during the pandemic, Why Cope When You Can Heal. I've introduced to the world what I call this, and I call it surgical empathy. Mm -hmm. And what is surgical empathy? Well, imagine that you're at your most desperate moment. You can't make the psychological pain go away. Uh you're feeling hopeless, you're feeling helpless, worthless, useless, purposeless, meaningless. And when they all come together, pointless. Yeah. And what happens is when you live in that pain, and it's just not, not, it's not momentary, you form a psychological adhesion to death to take the pain away. Oh, so wow. an, ad an adhesion is kind of what happens when you have surgery and after they leave surgery, sometimes you're, you know, be, after the surgery, your organs form adhesions. Sometimes you have to go back in and cut the adhesions. Yeah. So when someone forms a psychological attachment, not an attachment, excuse me, an adhesion to death, they don't listen to insight. They don't listen to reason. They don't listen to suggestions because it's an adhesion. And so you have to go in with surgical empathy. And when they feel felt by you and not judged, uh, they can sometimes let go of the death as the only way out of their pain and grab on to the empathy. I'll give you one example, which uh, I've Please. sometimes shared because it was maybe the most dramatic example that just shifted everything and really amped up my listening into people's eyes. So Dr. Schneidman had referred me a patient that I will call Nancy. That's not her name. And she'd been in the hospital three or four times over the previous years, sometimes staying a month or two months. And she made three or four suicide attempts. And he referred it to me. And I would see her a couple times a week. And she never made eye contact. She would, if you're me, she'd be looking like this. Yeah. And she wasn't catatonic, but she was kind of lifeless. 
And in those days, I used to moonlight at Metropolitan State Hospital in Norwalk, uh, which was a psychiatric state hospital. And I would cover for other psychiatrists during the weekend, meaning I'd be called to the inpatient wards. I'd write for medicines. I'd <clears throat> deal with patients that were getting agitated. I do I do new uh, admissions who had to, who came in over the weekend, and sometimes you don't sleep for twenty four hours, maybe even longer. So in one particular weekend, I hadn't slept for twenty four hours, and then I go to my office, and there's Nancy on a Monday, and she's in her usual characteristic pose. And as I'm in the office with her, and I'm looking at her, suddenly all the color in the room turned to black and white. Mm -hmm. And I get the chills. And I thought I was having a stroke or a seizure. And I did a neurologic exam on myself. I'm a psychiatrist, so I was trained in that also. And it wasn't rude because she's like this. And I'm, po you know, I'm pointing fingers like this, seeing if I'm seeing double, tapping my elbows, tapping my knees. And I realized, oh, I'm all here. I'm not having a stroke or a seizure. And I just felt this chill. And because I was sleep deprived, I blurted out something that normally I wouldn't. And I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad. Mm. And I can't, I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. And I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to, to get out of all the pain. And I thought to myself, did I think that or did I say that? And I thought, I just gave her permission to do it. I'm screwed. <laughs> right. Yeah. And she looked at me. That was the first time she looked at me. And then she grabbed onto my eyes like I'm grabbing onto yours. And I said, well, what are you thinking? Because I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. I'm overdue. <laughs> <laughs> And she looked at me and she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of this pain, maybe I won't need to. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, I was right. And then she smiled. And then I grabbed under her eyes because we were making eye contact for the first time. And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm not going to give you treatments that you've been tried on that really didn't work. Unless you say, maybe we should try such and such again. Would that be okay? And she looked at me and she went, uh-huh, keep talking. And then I looked into her eyes and I said, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to find you wherever you are. I'm going to keep you company there uh, for as long as it takes, because I don't want you to be alone there anymore. Would that be okay? And then her eyes started to water up. Now, I know some of your listeners are thinking, we can't do that. We're just regular people. This guy's off the charts. You know, there's something you know, <laughs> that, that's wild and crazy. But, I'll hear, but I will tell you something because something I'm really most passionate about, and we can talk about the documentary that I, I co-created and moderated called Stay Alive, which is on Amazon Prime. Here are four prompts that you can use if you're worried about someone you love, especially a teenager. Uh, it's, it's epidemic now. Mental health, depression, suicide, and teenagers, young adults, it's off the charts. Here are the four prompts. Do it while you're doing an activity. Uh, uh, and you want to do that because teenagers can't stand heart-to-heart -heart talks when they're not initiating them. Mm -hmm. It's like it, it is nails on a chalkboard. Trust me on that. Yeah. And so yeah. while you're doing something, maybe when you're riding, driving or running an activity, you're kind of in parallel. And what you can say is, you know, a lot of us parents are kind of worried about the pandemic and how it's affecting our kids. And we're all worried about it. And I'm worried about you. And can I just run some things by you? And again, you're not intruding on their space because you're, you're kind of driving. This is a really intimate conversation. Hopefully they'll say, okay, mom, okay, dad. 
And here are the four prompts. And this is a taste of surgical empathy. Um, at, at its worst, how awful are you capable of feeling about your life for yourself? You're going to go, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. At its worst, how awful are you capable of feeling about your life for yourself? Pretty awful. Surgical empathy. Pretty awful or very awful? Okay, mom. Okay, dad. Very awful. Second prompt. And when you're feeling that, how alone do you feel? Pretty alone. Surgical empathy. Pretty alone or all alone? Okay, okay, all alone. Here's the third prompt. Take me to the last time you felt that. What? Or WTF? Yeah, take me to the last time you felt that. Was it 2.30 in the morning a few nights ago? We heard you walking around in your room and, you know, and something interesting and almost magical happens when they start to describe something so clearly that you can see it. They refeel it, but they're not alone. Yeah, yeah, I was walking around. Yeah, it was 2 30 in the morning. Yeah, we heard that. What was going on? I couldn't get to sleep. Yeah, we figured that out. What was going on? What'd you try? I, I didn't know what to do. You know, I felt like punching the pillow. I punched the pillow. I felt like punching the wall. Wow. What'd you do next? I didn't know what to do. I, I, I started looking for cough medicine. Did you find any? Uh, no. Uh, I started looking for your sleeping pills, Mom. Did you find those? No. Oh, good. We have them hidden. Uh, uh, then what happened? I was going out of my mind, Mom. And then the sun rose. And I felt a little better. Mm. Fourth prompt. By this time, you might pull over the car. By this time, if we were doing an activity, you might put down and you look in their eyes and you say, uh, I got a favor to ask you. And hopefully they'll say what? The next time you feel that way or you're getting close to feeling that way, you do whatever it takes to get my or your dad's undivided attention. Because we're, we're busy doing too many things. And there is nothing more important to your dad or me for you to let us know when you're feeling that way because we don't want you to feel so alone with it. Mm -hmm. You got it? So can you follow that? I can. That's amazing. And thank you so much for sharing that. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful. And we're going to talk about some of the things that you pointed out throughout that uh, description and answer and sort of almost triage. I am curious why suicide prevention and therapy stuck with you. Was it, was it about what you said earlier about how you saw maybe in advance or predicting a decline in mental health funding, uh, the way that hospitals and, and mental health facilities um, took on patients, released patients, or was it something within yourself where by providing help to patients, you were somehow helping yourself as well? Maybe it was both. Well, we all have a backstory and I got a backstory and uh, I'll tell you it. One of my, I've accomplished a fair amount. I mean, you know, most of the stuff you said in the introduction was even true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think one of my greatest personal accomplishments, and I don't know anyone who's done this, I dropped out of medical school twice and finished. And I didn't drop out to see the world. I dropped out because I think I had untreated depression. Mm -hmm. And so I was highlighting every book I was reading. Every page was yellow. I could read it. I could sort of comprehend. I couldn't hold on to it. And the first time I took a leave of absence, I went out and I worked in a blue collar job and I loved it. I still romanticize it. I was finished at 5 p.m., no stress, no responsibilities. <clears throat> and my mind worked at that level. And so I come back and then six months later, 
after I come back, the depression's back. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm miraculously passing everything. And so I decide to take another time off. I met with the head of the school and he's about funding. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize is every time someone takes time off, the medical school loses funding from the government. And so an empty space loses their money. And I can understand from his point of view, let's cut our losses. He, he dropped out, he's back, he wants to drop out again. Uh, let's cut our losses. And I met with him, I don't even remember the meeting, but he sent a letter over to the Dean of Students who cared about students. Mm -hmm. and, and I think to the credit to the dean of the school, who wasn't the most empathic person, you know, I think he referred me to the dean of students because he didn't want me to do something self-destructive. Right. And so the dean of students, uh, an Irish Catholic in Boston named Dean William McNary, we affectionately called him Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls me and he says, Mac, this is Mac, Mac, better get in here, Mac. Got a letter from the dean. Better get in here. We'll read it together, Mac. So I go in there, and the letter says, I have met with Mr. Goulston. It's from the main dean. We talked about alternate careers, and, my, and I'm advising the promotions committee that he be asked to withdraw because I was still passing courses. And I said, what does this mean? And Mac said to me, Mac, you've been kicked out. And it was like a body blow. Mm. It was like being shot in the abdomen. And I know what that feeling is like because I had a perforated colon. I almost died from about 12 years ago, and I just pulled it over. And I'm not a religious or spiritual person. And when he said that, I felt something wet on my cheekbones, and I thought I, it was, I thought it was blood. I kept looking at my hands, and it was tears. Mm -hmm. Now, I come from a background, you know, good parents, but depression age parents, and you're only worth what you can do. If you can't do anything, you're not worth much. And that's not an unusual background to come from. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so he says that to me. And then he looks at me and he says, Mac, you didn't mess up because you're passing everything. But you are messed up. Mm -hmm. And then he gave me the trifecta of hope, which is what I used with my suicidal patients for over 30 years. He said, Mac, uh, you didn't mess up. Uh, but I think if you got unmessed up, this school would be glad they gave you a second chance. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, huh? And then here's the first part of the trifecta of hope unconditional love he said and even if you don't get unmessed up even if you don't become a doctor even if you don't do anything the rest of your life i'd be proud to know you because you have something in you that we don't grade but the world needs it so that's the unconditional love i, I didn't know what he was talking about and he said, it's something the world needs, but you won't know how much it needs it till you're 35. So he saw a future for me that I didn't see. Mm -hmm. So the world's going to need what you have when you're 35. And then the third part of the trifecta is, but you need to make it till you're 35. And then he pointed at me and he said, and you deserve to be on this planet. And you're going to let me help you. Mm -hmm. so he stood up for me to the medical school saying we're going to give this one a second chance if he had said you know uh, if i can help you give me a call uh, you know it's foolish pride i would have gone back to my apartment probably wouldn't have called him probably wouldn't be here so that was the trifecta wow. of hope. seeing value goodness in people that they don't have to perform for you to see. They don't have to do anything. 
They just have to be someone who doesn't hurt the world. Seeing a future that you don't see, and then going out of your way to stand up for them and be protective. Yeah. So when I was practicing, you know, my emotional gesture was, it was like emotionally grabbing them by the nape of the neck and said, you're not going anywhere. Sorry about that. You know, you know, you know, uh, you want to check out, you know, not on my watch. Uh, right, right. Uh, and then when I asked some of my patients, so here's some insight into people that feel suicidal. Uh, one of them, I asked them, uh, what was helpful? What seemed to work? Uh, they, and I remember this one fellow said, uh, I'm a burden to everyone. Hmm. I scare my parents. They're worried. My brother and sister think I'm manipulative, which I am. Don't seem to really have life figured out. So my life's a burden to me. And so I figure, why not just check out and disemburden everyone? Mm -hmm. But when I first met you, Dr. Goulston, you had this smile on you like you were glad to see me. I didn't know who you were looking at. It had nothing to do with whether I was following my treatment plan or whatever. You know, you you just were happy to see me. I thought you were crazy, but I wasn't a burden to you. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like an island or an oasis. It's powerful so, stuff. Yeah. So, so uh, is this landing for you? Uh, can you track any of this stuff? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's a through line into so many experiences in my own life where you've taken me to a place where I have to remember that I'm interviewing you versus sitting in a chair across from you, ready to sort of bear my soul. So that's, that's how much it's tracking with me. And, um, you know, you could bear a little, and I can tell you, because I do lots of interview, it makes for great radio and TV. Yeah, it does. I was going to say this audience that's been with me from the beginning and us from the beginning has heard me confess a lot of things on, on the air. So they kind of would know what I'm talking about here, just from all the disappointments of being an artist and a creative and things you've succeeded at, things you failed at, expectations. It, it was kind of all wrapped in there. You you talked a lot about what wasn't working and hasn't worked and isn't working today in healthcare. And 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 especially in the sort of area of of mental health and suicide prevention. What is working and how can we get people to pay the attention to it that it deserves year round versus just in October for suicide prevention month. Let's say it's almost uh, akin to what we do with black history month, where it's like, we love black people in February. And then once February is over, okay. <laughs> you had your month. We're turning off the jazz music. <laughs> no more Martin Luther King speeches, please. Uh, no more of that. We're we're past that. And how do we prevent that in the world of mental health? And just for the audience, we're recording this at the end of September, and uh, so we know that that uh, this will likely be published in in October. So, with that, what what do you think is working, and and how do we increase awareness beyond just the month of October? Well, if you're if you're listening in or you're watching this and you're hurting mentally, um, and you have a decent parent, and if you don't have a decent parent, a decent coach, mm -hmm. a decent teacher, a decent mentor, a decent friend. And it's very scary, but I think if you reach out to them, and uh, and be respectful and say, you know, when you have a moment, uh, you know, can we talk for a little bit? And 
again, you don't want to necessarily scare them, but you want to open up to them. I'll share another anecdote. This is the most powerful moment of my entire life that I'm going to share with you. Please. When I was at a real low point, I had to tell my dad I was dropping out of medical school. And my dad, uh, may, may he rest in peace, was a, was a strong and tough guy uh, at, the, at the company he worked for. He was the one who fired people, mm -hmm. hired them. Uh, even the head of the company was a little bit intimidated by him. So he was a no-nonsense kind of guy. And, uh, and I remember I had to tell him uh, because uh, I had a certain amount of time or else I, we'd have to pay tuition and we'd lose the money and whatnot. And I met with him and I said, uh, uh, I'm leaving medical school. And he looked at me and he said, what, you flunk out? <laughs> I said, no. He said, wait, I'm not getting this. You didn't flunk out and you're leaving medical school? Yeah. Why? Uh, well, I'm, you know, reading stuff and I'm not holding on to it. Uh, and I'm just not holding on to it. And, uh, and he said, you're passing everything? Yeah. He said, well, you know, you're passing everything, so you're good enough for them. And, uh, uh, and then I said a few more words, and he started drilling me. Mm. And, then I, and then he said, so you'll get a tutor. You're passing everything. You know, uh, we'll, you'll get through it. We'll, you'll get a tutor who will help you with the different topics. And he is so strong. And he was a good guy, but as I said, depression age, you know, life wasn't easy for him. So he's talking, and I'm looking down like this, and I'm thinking, if I go back, something something bad's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Not bad to anyone else. And I remember he said something. So we're agreed. You're not. You're going to stay in, and you're going to get tutors. Mm. And then imagine looking into the eyes of someone who intimidated you. And I looked into his eyes. And I said, you don't seem to get it. I'm afraid. And I just stared at him. And tears came down my cheeks and I just stared at him. And he looked at me, then he looked down and clenched his fists out of frustration. He didn't want to hurt me. And he said, do, do what you need to do. Uh, your mom and I will try and, you know, figure this out with you. Mm -hmm. It was the most powerful moment of my life. So why am I saying this? If you're feeling this, I can tell you, I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. One of the things that parents can't stand is excuses. If I had started making excuses, if I had started, you know, saying, well, this isn't working or that isn't working, uh, it feels like your child's being evasive. You're making excuses. You know, you know, what are you not telling me? And and if you're listening or watching to this, what your child might not be telling you is looking into your eyes and just totally being raw and trusting you and saying, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that I don't want to make it because it hurts so much. And see, I think if those conversations took place, Parents might stop their throwing stuff at you. You can do this and stop thinking that way, or it's just the phase you're going through. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple documentaries I'm involved with. One of them, which you know of, is called Stay Alive, an intimate conversation about suicide prevention. In it, I interview Kevin Hines and a Japanese pop star named Reiko, 
And Kevin Hines, I love this guy. And if you look him up, he's he has saved so many lives. He jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a CNN hero of the month a, a couple of years ago. Uh, they're putting nets up along the sides of the Golden Gate Bridge. So if someone jumps, uh, it catches them. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. And then they get caught up in the net and then someone rescues them. And, and the amount of people who jump off that bridge is huge, but you don't know about it because they get washed out to sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was majorly responsible for that. So in Stay Alive, uh, it, it's a about an hour and a quarter documentary, and he tells his story. Yep. And he tells about being, it was interesting, I was just on his podcast, um, and he was, and and I drilled down and I said, uh, uh, what were you feeling just before you jumped over the railing? Mm -hmm. And he said, I couldn't take it anymore. I mean, I just, you know, it'd been going on for a while. And, 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 and he admits, he says, you know, I have, I, he has bipolar illness, so he can get really depressed and maybe manic. And he needs medication. He hates the medication, but it stabilizes him. And I was recently on his podcast called Hindsight, H-I-N-E, Sight, because his last name is Kevin Hines. Mm -hmm. And he said, I would have just liked one person to stop me and talk to me. And he said, one person did that before I jumped over the rails but it was, I think it was someone, a, a tourist, and the tourist said, can you take my picture? <laughs> oh, man. And so I think he took the picture. Wow. Yeah. But one of the things we did on his podcast, which took him back to it, because I looked into his eyes on the podcast, and I said, you know, I, I wish I'd been there. Because mm -hmm. if I was there, I would have said, let's sit down. Let's, you know, let's sit down on the ground with our backs to the railing and tell me what's going on. Uh, one of the other uh, elements of surgical empathy is something that I learned from a, the, a, uh, one of the, C the COO of the Marines in the 1990s. And he was the first CEO of the U.S. Intrepid uh, aircraft carrier on the Hudson. And one of the things he used to do, because we worked on a transition program for returning Marines, and he introduced me to the five realies. And the five realies are a kind of surgical empathy. So uh, someone tells you what's going on. And you say, uh, Marine, I understand it's dif different being in a war and being home, but what's really going on? Well, you know, people just don't understand it if they haven't been in the military. I understand that, Marine, but what's really going on? Well, you know, my spouse and I were just arguing all the time and, you know, and I'm frustrated and he or she's angry. And, and he said, when you get to the fifth really with a Marine who's been in active duty, he said, a number of them would look them straight in the eye like deers in the headlights. And they would say, sir... I saw and did horrific things. And when I close my eyes, I see them vividly. So I don't close my eyes much, sir. Mm -hmm. And he would give them a direct order. He would say, if you were a Marine in war, we've all been there. I'm giving you a direct order. Put it aside because you've earned the right to a life. Yeah. And he got letters from spouses saying, you saved my spouse's life. And so uh, getting back to Kevin, I said, I wish I had, I, th I think I did this on the podcast, I, uh, his podcast, I'd sit there and I'd say, what's really going on? And we just keep digging. And then at some point, and he was tearing up on the podcast, and I said, at some point, you'd, you'd go and you'd go and you'd go and you'd get deeper. And at some point, you'd just collapse with your head on my shoulder because you couldn't take it anymore and you didn't have anything else to say, but the hurt was out 
And I, and I said, Kevin, I, and I put my arm around you. And we just stayed there. Hmm. I said, now I have mixed feelings about that, Kevin, because you jumped over the bridge. You miraculously survived. And for over 20 years now, you've been saving people's lives, sharing your story. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like, well, there could be a lot more dead. Yeah, I'll, I'll share something else, which is something else I'm working on. You saving him might create some cosmic tragedy of the commons. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Somehow. Especially, yeah, especially. Uh, uh, there was an interesting insight that he gave about, he said, when he jumped over the railing, in a split second, he realized this is the biggest mistake I've ever made. Oh, wow. And what I explained to him is, and here's a little, uh, here's a little neuroscience. I said, uh, you were stressed out from your mental illness, not, nothing getting better. So your cortisol was through the roof. Mm -hmm. High cortisol is high stress. And something that a lot of people don't know about high cortisol and stress is high oxytocin counteracts high cortisol. Mm -hmm. So emotional connectivity with another person lowers your cortisol. And when your cortisol gets lower, you begin to think again, you know, maybe this isn't a good idea. And I said, the miracle was that as soon as you went over the roll, the rails, death connected with you and said, going to take your pain away. And as soon as you realize that death was going to take your pain away, in a nanosecond, the pain went away and you realized, I don't want to die, but it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And he wraps himself up yeah. into a ball and he yeah. lands in the water, which is like hitting concrete and he breaks most of his spine and his pelvis, you know, but he recuperates. And, uh, and even part of his story, which is magical, is, you know, everything was broken and he was just lying in the water and he said, uh, a couple dolphins came over, or a dolphin came over. Wow. Maybe, maybe dolphins. And, and, and the dolphin came over and went underneath them and carried Kevin on his back until, you know, some ship or something who had seen him came by and got him. So you know, me. That's yeah, we got to yeah. save the dolphins. I mean, they're picking up, <laughs> they're picking up vibes. They want to save our lives. I did. Some, that's that's the, my next piece of research: the the life saving dolphins of the Golden Gate Bridge. There you go. So, but here's something I want to share, which is which is new. Um, <clears throat> I've been looking for 25 years for a vehicle that will change the way parents and teenagers speak to each other. Hmm. Okay. Because too often teenagers don't open up. No, yeah. And uh, because if they start to open up, they don't open up with their hurt and they're afraid. They say, I'm okay. You know, they're moody. And what happens is it triggers their parents. Well, you don't seem okay. Well, I'm okay. Just get off my back. Well, did you do your homework? Yeah, I'll get to it. And then in the morning, you didn't do your homework. Yeah, and no, I fell asleep. Well, you're doing too many video games. Well, the video games they're addicted to as a way of coping with everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine named Jason Reed, he became a friend because four years ago, his 14-year-old son uh, died by suicide. Mm -hmm. And his 14-year-old son wrote a suicide note called Tell My Story. And that's another documentary that's on Amazon Prime. And Jason went up and down the West Coast talking to uh treatment centers, parents, teenagers who had been suicidal. And uh, it, it's heart-wrenching. It's, it's really, they're both worth watching. But what he realized is what was most powerful was when the teenagers who are not suicidal now talked about their down periods. So he has created a documentary called What I Wish My Parents Knew. Mm -hmm. And he just interviews 10 teenagers who are so likable who are doing okay who are doing well now but he says talk about that down period so it's just these 10 teenagers 
And what happens is they open up about their down periods. Mm -hmm. They open up about never telling anyone. They open up about not wanting to burden their parents. And it's brilliant because it's the teenagers are diverse. There's a young white girl. There is a, a black gay man. There's a black uh, uh, female uh, athlete. There is a, uh, a competitive tennis player. There's a Latina. Uh, uh, and, and when I've shown, and it's not going to be on Netflix or YouTube. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is the cyber bullies would kill these kids. They'd come in and say, well, maybe you should have killed yourself. All right. So it's only going to be shown in high school and junior high auditoriums for parents. That's and it's great. a 40, it's a 45 minute uh, uh, documentary. And then after that, and this is going to be a challenge to coordinate is we'll bring in parents and teens who have had a close call and are communicating differently now and how they're communicating differently. And then we'll bring in some mental health resources, but what the parents are going to, all the parents are going to be riveted because they're going to see their kids in these teenagers. And the, and what's happening is when people have seen, when, you know, we've shared it very, it, it's not done yet. We've shared it very privately, but when parents have seen it, they go home they see their teenagers and they're crying and their teenagers are saying, what's wrong, mom? What's wrong, dad? And what they're saying with tears in their eyes is I just realized how much I love you. Cause what they're thinking about, what if my teenager is feeling those things when he or she is shutting themselves off in their room? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, excited I, I can't find a better word but i've been looking for this for over 20 years and i think it has the potential to change the conversation because i will tell you mental health resources are not the answer because they're few and far between there's so much of a stigma uh I, i'm not saying you shouldn't seek them out but it's really difficult and for yeah. people who don't have people who don't have money, it's months to see a therapist or a child psychiatrist. So it's going to be up to parents to find a different way to connect with their kids, as opposed to having the kid frustrate or anger them, and then they throw all this stuff at the kids. And because what the kids are really saying is what Nancy said to me: "I can't go where you are." You're going to have to come to me. Yeah. And I think so much of what ails us as individuals and even as a society comes back to parents, comes back to raising our children in a way where they have the confidence to take on the world, uh, have a standard to live up to, but know that they are loved unconditionally. You know, at, at the same time, I want to introduce you and we can talk offline about this to a lady named Sheila Andreen. She is the CEO and founder of IndieFlix. And she takes educational content just like this, walks them straight into classrooms across the country. She's distributed across the nation. And they will watch the films and where you're going to bring in mental health resources she brings in full curriculums about the film they just watched and it's this incredibly unique distribution model that is aligned with purpose so well and she has mastered it she spent the last 10 or 15 years doing this before that she was on the wonder years the great show from the the 90s and 80s 90s and now she's doing this and and just killing it out there, um, probably terrible language choice of words there considering the topic, but you know what I mean? She's crushing it. Let's put it that way. I would love for you to, to reach out to her. You, you talked about military sort of naval officers 
And you're right, by the way, I mean, the suicide rate with people coming back from war, coming overseas or in the military has skyrocketed in the last 20 years. But for those listening to this conversation, have you worked with creatives in the past, filmmakers, artists? And do you yeah. think they have a propensity for sadness or depression because they're going? Is there a thing where you're trying to go after something so big, a dream so large that that you've put Here's yourself I, in this this weird space? I, I know you were also part of the movie Confessions of a Superhero, and that came to mind, too. Uh Here's one of the issues. Um, uh, I'm part of a big entrepreneurial community, you know, mm -hmm. which has a lot of creatives, a lot of technologists, yeah. a lot of creatives. And the frequency of bipolar two and ADD is off the charts. Mm. And bipolar two means bipolar one means that when you get manic, you get psychotic, you get delusional. You know what you're doing is is really crazy. Bipolar 2 means when you get manic, you're not psychotic, uh, and, and you're incredibly creative. You know, this is probably wrong to say, but I'll say it anyway. Um, there's a good chance that uh, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos uh, uh, are bipolar 2, meaning that mm -hmm. when they get manic, when they, the, the energy to see that vision and then actually turn it into something, it's huge. But when they go dark, they go radio silent. Mm. You know, I was kind of a student of Steve Jobs. And in fact, for a year and a half, I did a one man show called Steve Jobs Returns, where I played him coming back from the dead. Yeah. After he got kicked out yeah, or uh, back from the literal dead. Which one do you mean? No, no, back from the little dead. So I came okay, back it. and I played him from coming back to Apple until the introduction of the iPhone. And there's video clips of me doing it. And, uh, but I became a student of him and I was able to, this is a, a silly word, but I was able to sort of channel him. I was able to look at the world through his eyes and, and, and I, and I, and I've given talks on how to think like a visionary Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but becoming a student of him after he got kicked out, he went really dark. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think suicidal, but he went really dark. So if you're a creative, one of the most difficult things is what goes up must come down, but what goes down comes up. The key is when you're down is to not isolate yourself, and that will be so difficult. Because, uh, in, in fact, I may, may, may be co-authoring a book with someone who's had amazing successes, but realized that he was bipolar too. Mm. So a, a number of those successes crashed. And... Uh, and one of the things that we're discovering, which a lot of your creatives will relate to, is uh, one of the reasons you're creative is you can connect dots from the air and turn them into your creations. Mm -hmm. You may not even know where they come from, but you can connect dots like the way blobs of mercury connect to each other. It's like ding, 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 ding. Wow. <laughs> and it's an amazing feeling. But when you're on the down curve, what a lot of creatives and people who are bipolar, bipolar too think are the dots aren't connecting. I don't think they're ever going to connect again. I've been on a fool's errand thinking that this would work and I could do this and everybody and the other naysayers who've been telling me, why don't you just get a job? Maybe they're right. Mm -hmm. And the feeling of utter humiliation and feeling alone with it is devastating. And that's the time when you least want to reach out to people because you're feeling all that. It's a time when you need to reach out to other people.
Yeah, I, I'm, three and, and I'm four sorry. that you mentioned are incredibly accurate. Mm-hmm. And uh, and in fact, I I would be open. Uh, uh, I'm a, I'm at a later stage of my I'm in my mid seventies. You look great. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a health issue which is going to shorten my life. Hopefully, not by that much, but. Uh, Everything I do has to matter. Mm. I don't have time to waste. And, and I could see a group. I, I could see, you know, maybe you would pull it together. Maybe your friend would film it of creatives where what they talk about is, well, talk about when the dots connected. Oh, he came up with this and it was so great. And then, and then it crashed. Right. Talk about when you couldn't make the dots connect. And talk about when you thought they'd never connect again. Mm -hmm. And talk about when you felt really foolish and all the non-creatives. I'll tell you, if you are a creative, write this down. So this is a this is this is uplifting. Right. And right laugh, now. Yeah, and you'll laugh it up. And you'll laugh at it. Uh, when people say no to you, it doesn't mean um. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, you shouldn't do something uh, or that you're wrong. It just means they won't help you. <laughs> <laughs> Simple, but 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 perfect. And thank you for that. That is that that is fantastic. I I do want to talk about stay alive and get a little bit into the, I think we talked a good bit about the purpose of the film, but stylistically having, uh, you know, Kevin Hines there, uh, having Rayco at the table, you're drinking coffee, you're talking these things through. Um, what was the choice there to, to have the documentary filmed in that style? And then uh, what role did your, partner in this Frank Kilpatrick play uh, in, in the film and how did he help and how did you guys get together? You seem like you're from slightly different worlds, although you're both entrepreneurs. Well, we're part of this entrepreneurial community and I love Frank. He's like a brother. He, uh, and he, you know, he, and he's had a fair amount of successes and it's really important for him to leave the life better, uh, leave the world better. Mm. And so as we've gotten to know each other, you know, he knows that the, uh, uh, that I have that side of me, uh, you know, so whatever entrepreneurial successes I have, don't even get on the radar when it comes to, I hope I've saved a life or two. And so we really bonded and he wanted to do something and he's a creative, he's a musician, he's an executive producer. And, uh, and we would have long conversations like you and I are having and like you and I are going to have in the future offline. And he said, he said, Mark, we, we got to get this information out there because one of my challenges is I never scaled. Um, and it was interesting because researchers in depression and suicide would send their kids to me and I would say, any way you want to see what we're doing, because it seems to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And they would say, if it's not evidence-based and you don't have control groups, we can't look at it. And they said, well, why are you sending me your kids? Why don't you, <laughs> send, why don't you send them to your university? And they said, well, we don't have your track record. And I said, there's a disconnect here, but you're not curious no, just see my kid. So I just defaulted. I'd say, send me your kid. So I never scaled, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's not who I am. But given the, given the fact that I've learned some things and I've shared some things that I hope are helpful, and I have a certain pressure on time to get this stuff out in the world, if it can be helpful, I think Frank saw that. He said, Mark, you have a way of connecting, you know, and you can teach other people to open up. 
And so that was the beginning of it. And at that point, uh, I remember I, I, I saw Kevin Hines give one of his incredible talks. And, and I met Kevin and afterwards, and he had met Dr. Ed Schneidman, who was one mm, of my mentors. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so we bonded over that. And then, you know, we kind of got to know each other. And then Frank said, why don't we just sit down with Kevin and Reiko, who's this beautiful Japanese rock musician, uh, but she's an advocate for suicide prevention because the suicide rates in the gaming communities, in the music community, in the Japanese, Chinese, and uh, other Asian communities is off the charts. Yeah. So, so the idea was, Frank said, well, maybe we'll just sort of sit down and see where it goes. And that's what we did. And we, we, I think we sat down for about five, six hours, and then they edited it into what it is. And mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah, everyone should go check it out. It's on Amazon Prime. You can rent it in HD for $4.99. You can buy it for $7.99. I recommend that you do that. And we will talk again at the end about where people can see and purchase all of your work. All of it is is incredibly powerful. And and I, you mentioned, hopefully you shared something that's helpful today. Uh, you have definitely shared many, 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 many things that are going to be helpful for anyone listening to this, even beyond the creative community. You mentioned, or, you, or I guess you've been quoted as saying that entrepreneurs are racing away from feelings. And you being part of this entrepreneurial community, can you just explain that briefly? What does that mean? Entrepreneurs are always racing away from feelings. Well, I would think, um, and why entrepreneurs, I, should, I suppose, because I'm an entrepreneur. So I was selfishly curious in the answer. Well, a significant portion of entrepreneurs had learning issues. You know, uh, uh, what's his name from uh, Virgin uh, uh, Richard Branson? Learning Richard issues. Branson. Yeah, uh, dyslexia, uh, Ted Turner. And so what happened is a lot of entrepreneurs were made to feel they were stupid because they just didn't fit in the boxes when they were young. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and they weren't having a good time being made to feel that they were stupid. Mm -hmm. And what happened is they discovered something. They discovered that they could see things that other people couldn't see and make things that other people couldn't make. And then many of them were determined to uh, uh, to just uh, uh, th that was life saving for them. And I would say, uh, I think uh, Jason Reed, who's a serial entrepreneur, who whose son is the one who died by suicide, right. said a quarter to a third of entrepreneurs became entrepreneurs to treat their depression from childhood. They were depressed wow. because they just didn't fit in. And so they're racing into that as a way to help their uh, entrepreneurial spirit. But something else they're racing away from. And if you're listening in, I have a, I have a podcast called My Wake Up Call. Mm -hmm. uh, and a whole range of interesting people from Larry King uh, uh, to Norman Lear to Jordan Peterson to uh, uh, recently I interviewed Nolan Bushnell. He was the, uh, 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 he, he founded Atari, Chuck E. Cheese, and uh, uh, he was Steve Jobs' first boss mm -hmm. at Atari. And uh, I had an interesting interview with a fellow named Chip Conley. Chip Conley uh, founded Joie de Vivre Hotels, and then he pivoted to Airbnb, and then he reached a point in his life, and this is all on the podcast, my wake-up call, Chip Conley. And he reached a point where he said, you know, I'm addicted to achievement, and it doesn't make me happy. In fact, there was a point where five of his friends died by suicide. Wow. He was depressed and suicidal, had all the money he needed, 
And he realized he was addicted to achievement, but it, and that's all he knew, but it didn't make him happy. He hated not achieving, but achieving didn't make him happy. So he pivoted and he has something called the Modern Elder Academy, which has these amazing retreats for people. I, I think the, the youngest you can be is 40-ish, 45 and older, but it's for people who maybe were successful and life is empty. You know, you know, so I have this money, but I'm unhappy. I'm not close to anyone. So it was interesting on the podcast. He's talking about this. And then I brought up something to him. Which he he didn't really note. But then he thought about it and wrote about in Modern Elder Academy. I said, Chip, you might have something called the syndrome of disavowed yearning, write that down, mm -hmm. the syndrome of disavowed yearning. And he said, what does that mean? I said, what it means is when you were young, when you, when we were, when we were in the womb, we were all whole, mm -hmm. W-H-O-L-E. Our wish was our mom's command. You know, and hopefully if she wasn't on drugs or whatever, you, we were hungry, she fed us. You know, we're cold, it's warm, it's, it's warm in the uterus there. But when we pop out in the world, and I think one of the reasons we cry so loudly is we go from being the master of the universe inside our mom to totally helpless and powerless, and we can't even communicate what we need. <laughs> so we're screaming, <laughs> wait a minute, I want to go back into the womb. And, and what I said is, there is a deep memory and desire to go back to that whole feeling of peace mm -hmm. we felt in the womb. But if we had rough childhoods, if we're told we're stupid, if one of our parents has a drug problem, if our parents are divorced, if our parents are angry, what happens is we're not getting what we need to feel whole from the world. And if we disavow needing it, if we say to ourselves, I don't need it because look what I did. I, I just, I'm a mini entrepreneur. I just mm -hmm. made something and I'm selling it to, to the kids around me. This is cool. And so what happened is we, convinced ourselves we didn't need to feel whole and peaceful and free from depression and free from anxiety and just free from feeling psychologically unsafe like most people feel in their jobs. So we convinced ourselves, I don't need it because I can make stuff. Right. But what happens is if making stuff uh, doesn't bring you happiness, you know, then what do you do? And so, and a lot of entrepreneurs are not good at emotionally connecting. One of the things I used to do since I was in the suicide prevention area, I also did house calls to dying patients to help them find peace of mind at the end of their life. And, and, and I'll mention a couple of them. I can't mention their names because they're pretty famous. One of them was, you know, you know, had sort of, crazy personal life, multiple divorces, you know, kids on drugs and yada, 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 yada. But he was one of the most beloved people in America. Had hospital named after him, uh, all kinds of stuff. And when I would visit these people when they're dying, what people have always seemed to like about me is I, I don't think I'm judgmental, but I could be pretty blunt. Mm. And I said to him, I said, hey, what's up? You look like crap. And I don't think it's because you're dying. <laughs> I don't think it's because you're dying. You've been dying as long as I've known you. What's up? <laughs> no one dared talk to him that way. Right. He said, I don't think I've ever done anything important. I said, come again? He said, I don't think I've ever done anything important in life. I said, what are you, whacked? You got blah, 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 blah. And he looked at me and he said, don't con a con man, especially when he's dying. Mm -hmm. I've got all, I've got all the love that money can buy. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Huh?" I said, "So, so what's the issue?" And then he looked at me, super smart guy. 
He said, everything I thought was important is unimportant. And everything I thought was unimportant is important. And I've run out of time to fix it. Teaches you a lot. Then there was someone else I met who was a Grammy winning musician in three decades. And I said to him, uh, Hey, what was the deal with you being such an effing jerk? You know, I mean, you know, run-ins with the police, drugs, and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, and uh, and also, you know, why were you so miserable? So here are two things he told me, because, I mean, you you got to learn a lot when you go to these kind of house calls. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I said, you know, you know, why were you so, you know, frustrated most of your life? He said, there were five times in my life when the mu- the pure music in my mind matched the music that I made and played. And knowing it was possible, I tried to make it happen every time, and it only happened five times. Mm. And I said, you're an idiot. <laughs> I said, you know perfection that's flirting with God. Right. You know it five times, and you made that the standard to live up to. You were a perfectionist on steroids. You're not going to make any more music. Can you, can you let it go for crying out loud? Doctor's orders. And he smiled. Uh, it was also the day his Doberman pincer attacked me and pulled. It, it didn't break the skin, but he pulled the sleeve off my sweater. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, so maybe the vibes in the room were a little bit. But here's the other thing that I thought was interesting. I said, what was all that stuff about the drug use and all that? He said, you know, I knew I had a gift. But I had a lot of people that took credit for it. My pushy mom, you know, some of the agents. And so every time, you know, and I'd win an album or something, they'd say, that's our good little boy. Mm -hmm. And he said, but when I did drugs, that all belonged to me. Everybody needs one thing that they can own that other people don't spoil. I wasn't stupid enough to stop doing music, but, and I thought, wow, that was fascinating. Yeah. It really, it really is. And he talked about, mentioned your podcast, My Wake Up Call. This is a fantastic podcast. And if you're listening to this, I recommend that after you listen to this, you go find his podcast, uh, Mark's podcast. It's called My Wake Up Call. You can listen to it anywhere podcasts are played. There are hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds of five-star reviews. So not only is it a five-star podcast, there isn't one rating or review that isn't five stars. And I listened to a lot of conversations on there. I did take the clickbait and listen to the Jordan Peterson conversation. I, I noticed that he wanted to debate with you a little bit and you resisted that. I didn't know why you resisted that. Well, I'll tell you, it was interesting. Jordan Peterson was interesting because Jordan, Jordan likes to debate because he's mm-hmm. usually smarter than people. Yeah. And, but I'm a fan of Jordan Peterson because I think he he is incredibly clear. And there was a point at which he, he, he in his Jordan Peterson way, talked about how, how unconditional empathy is bad. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to spoil your kids if you just empathize with them and the world's not going to. You're not doing, as, as he would say, you're not doing them a favor, you know. You know, you do, you're not doing them a favor when you do them with the empathy like that. And right. so I, I stopped. I stopped him in midstream. I said, if you're listening into this and you think what he said is negative or controversial, you need to listen to it again. Mm-hmm. Because what he's saying is accurate. You spoil your kid with unconditionally empathy and you give them awards for everything and the world's not going to do that. You're setting them up for failure. And I remember because I have the video, he looked at me like, huh. So I became a fan of his, Mm -hmm. but what was interesting, and you probably noticed in the podcast, 
is, and I know he's very busy. It was tough to schedule him. And so it was like 40 or 45 minutes. And I said, Jordan, well, thank you for the time. I know you're a very, very busy person. But what happened is because I was, I was not a fawning fan, but I was a fan of his brilliant intelligence. He said, I've got more time. Ask me another question. Mm -hmm. So you may remember that. I'll share one that has it. It'll, it'll be up by the time this posts. I recently interviewed Nolan Bushnell, who is yes. one of the most lovable characters from, from the technological history of America. He, he came up with Atari, Chuck E. Cheese. And one of the things that he shared that I thought was brilliant, he, he talked about being a parent, and he said, and so you'll get this from, uh, here's a little preview. He said, you know, uh, uh, you know, and he has that sort of absent-minded professor likability. He said, you know, I, I graduated 247th in my college class out of 247. <laughs> so, you know, so either I was, uh, you know, stupid or a little bit distracted. And what I realized, and this is what I tell my eight kids, because I see how parents can mess up their kids. And I thought this was brilliant. He said, um, you know, grades are not important. What's important is not what you, not your grade. It's what you learn that you can turn into what you know. And that no can be turned into an action that gets an outcome. He said, what's really important is what outcomes can you get in life? What results can you get in life? What can you actually do with what you know? Mm -hmm. And he is so right, because I see so many parents who push their kids to get grades so they can get into fancy colleges, and those kids don't even remember what they learned because they were busy focused on getting the good grades. And sadly, a number of them, when they go to college, they lose their curiosity. Mm -hmm. because they were part of this machine and 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 i will tell you most of those kids do not become entrepreneurs because they were able to get those grades to get into those great schools and yada 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 so uh but i thought what nolan said was just brilliant that it's what's really important is what you learn that you can turn into what you know that you can turn into an action and then how to work out and don't expect it to work out great the first time, you know, you just, you know, and then, you know, how can you, what can you, how can you iterate? Yes. And, I, and I, that was brilliant. I think it's very apropos for this audience. And one of our former guests comes to mind, Lee Abrams, who developed the sort of modern radio format. Mm -hmm. And when he started, no one was calling him a genius. You know, he had, very few options. It was, you know, make it in radio in Florida or not and, and just sort of whittle away. And he dug in two feet deep, had these incredible outcomes. And then people started calling him a genius. It's like, oh, he's a genius. And, then, and no one called him that before. He, he didn't earn that uh, in school. And so I think a lot of times you earn those accolades through your output and through sort of like you said, or like what Nolan said, what you know, turn it into an outcome. Uh, I do want to say you you talked about Jordan Peterson being busy and having limited time. I know you are busy and have limited time. You have been so wonderful. I have just a few more questions if you're good, and we'll we'll no, I'm we'll, good. I, we'll call this I, a conversation. I reserve this for time, and and there's also a tip I want to give. Mm -hmm dealing with setbacks and rejection so but you can ask me questions or i can just go into that uh, i will ask you a question and i'll put a note for tips because i think there'll be a, a space for that uh, for sure and i want to come into this you'll probably get the lead in here and understand where this is coming from but i'm i'm wondering uh how do you talk to assholes i mean how do you talk to crazy well, there's more to the lead in than you know. So here's, <laughs> here's, here's, here is Marketing 101. A friend of mine named Tony Baxter, he helped design Disney Paris and Disney Tokyo. Mm -hmm. 
And he introduced the concept to me, mental real estate. And I said, what is mental real estate? He said, it's when you come up with something that's familiar, people lean into what's familiar because it's not threatening. And then you twist it in their mind. You have mental real estate. He said, pirates of the Caribbean owns the word pirates in the minds of kids. So when mm -hmm. kids think of pirates, they think of pirates of the Caribbean. So Disney owns pirates. So uh, I have a book called Talking to Crazy, which is not about mental illness. It's about how do you deal with people that drive you crazy? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, I go, and I've spoken in Russia a couple times uh, because five of my books are bestsellers there. And the last time I spoke, I was I was a main speaker with uh, Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner. Thinking yeah, fast. Amazing. Uh, and I said, what do you have me for? I'm just some shrink from California. <laughs> they said, his book did not go viral. I said, what do you mean? So the Russian edition of Talking to Crazy is how to talk to assholes. It went viral across Russia. I get mm -hmm. to Moscow, which is a very, you know, Russians read a lot. You know, I can understand given, you know, I'm not getting into politics, but there's book kiosks, there's bookstores all over Moscow. And, and when I had time off, I'd go into the bookstore and I'd say, do you happen to have this book? And they'd say, oh, oh it's the it's the man who wrote talking to assholes. Come over, take a picture with us. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying is that's mental real estate. In fact, I went back to the publisher. I said, I think when it comes out in paperback, talking to crazy is a good title. But how to talk to assholes is a real winner. But, you know, this is why we're entrepreneurs. Well, it's already in the catalog. We can't do that. I said, it'll be a bestseller if you release it in paperback as how to talk to assholes. But, you know, go figure the publishing industry. Right. So, uh, uh, but that's what the book is about. And uh, here's a tip so, uh, about how to talk to assholes because you asked. Please. Uh, and this is a whole other story. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I was part of the O.J. Simpson trial. Oh. That's, a, that's a whole other episode. That's another hour. Yes, it is. Well, that's a round tour. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, you'll have me back. You'll say, Mark, people, people wanted you back. Yeah, tell us that story. But uh, one of the things I've discovered about all difficult people, these are the venters the complainers, the whiners, is they all, well, the, the, the venters may scare us, but they all frustrate us, anger us, uh, outrage us, and then that threatens to enrage us. Mm. And, and I write a regular call. I'm one of the founding uh, Newsweek expert forum experts. So there's an article up there. I'll send you a link to it. Um, yeah. and, and I said, something happens in our minds with difficult people that I call the outrage, enrage, bifurcate. And what that means is when someone outrages us in their behavior, because we're outraged, that's outrageous. A part of us wants to become enraged, but we're uncomfortable with becoming enraged. So we use all our energy to suppress our enrage because we're so uncomfortable with it. And, and when we're off balance, they can often get the better of us. They'll, cut, they'll go, go for the jugular. So here, here, uh, here's a tip that's going to change your life. Take out a sheet ready. of paper. I'm ready. Take out a sheet of paper, write, uh, draw a line down the middle of the sheet of paper. On the left side, write down all the people that drive you crazy. All the animals, all the whiners, all the complainers. How big no, does the sheet of paper need to be? <laughs> uh, could be an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, uh, and no one's going to see it unless you're an idiot and you leave it out there and uh, half right. your family is on that side. So you write all the people and, and you can, just their name puts a lump in your chest, in your throat, because they're so difficult. Yep. Right side, put a list of all the people that really are blessings to you. Mm -hmm that lift you up, that give you hope. And now go back to the left side and never expect them not to do something in a conversation that's not going their way. Mm -hmm. So always 
So, so don't go into the conversations with them, expecting them to be nice when they're never nice when something doesn't go their way. Right. And don't be aloof, but always hold a little bit of yourself back. Hmm. And then when they do whatever they do, look them directly in the eye because they're expecting you to be provoked and pause for two seconds. Uh, and they're going to get nervous because they thought what would enrage you was their knockout punch. Mm. Whatever they do, you look in their eyes, pause for two seconds, and then you go, huh. And, and they're going to get nervous. Uh, and then this is what you say. And there's a whole variety of things you can say to them. Uh, you go, huh. And they're going to go, what? And they're off balance instead of you being off balance. So here's something you can say. Uh, Here's one of my favorite lines, and we'll talk about it in the O.J. Simpson on another episode. Uh, could you repeat everything you just said? Because it sounded important and my mind wandered. <laughs> what? Yeah, it sounded important, but my mind wandered. I, you know, I, I think I have to feed the parking meter. Huh? Well, I, I, I apologize. You know, I got distracted, but I don't want to get a ticket. Right. They'll go, the, what's happened is they're disarmed. Or another thing you can say to them is, uh, can you run that by me again? You know, you, uh, uh, you know, the, way, the way you said it to me, you reminded me so much of this, this person from my junior high. I, I, I couldn't listen to you. I mean, I was, I was reliving it with, you know, with, uh, with Joey, gee, Joey, Joey used to drive me crazy. So could you repeat that instead of in a different tone of voice? Cause you know, it seemed like it was important. Yeah. Uh, so those are just a couple kind of tips, but, um, uh, I love it. I love the mind wondered because it's, you're right on the edge of living dangerously. You know, you have someone who's an angry person or as we've mentioned, kind of crazy or an asshole or whatever, and you tell them that, hey, my mind wandered, they could sort of take that as, I mean, it is a dismissal of what they just said. But yeah, they, it, it has the chance to make them even more angry. But I can see where they'd be so off balance, they, they couldn't respond with the anger. Yeah, I got to share a story. with you. I'm a man with many stories. So this story. Please, like. And feel free to share the OJ trial story, too, by the way. That's that's fine, because we can yeah. always revisit yeah. Now I have a bunch of time for, uh, but, uh, so in one of my books, I, I think it's talking to crazy. Mm -hmm. I share this story where I'm driving in Los Angeles and, uh, and if, if you're in Los Angeles, you know, you may know that the 405 goes from, uh, UCLA into the Valley and mm -hmm. it's, if the traffic's bad, you take Sepulveda. So I'm on Sepulveda Boulevard going into the valley. And I've had one of the worst days of my life. I mean, everything seemed to backfire. And I cut off this big redneck with his wife and his pickup truck. <laughs> and I cut him off and he honks the horn and I go, oh. and then I cut him off again. <laughs> And then I'm in such a funk and he pulls in front of me and I'm in such a funk, you know, I just stop behind him on the side and I can see his wife is telling him, don't get out of the truck, blah, 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 blah. And I can, and, and, but I'm in a funk right. and, he, and he comes outside and he comes over to my car and he bangs on the window and I'm in such a funk that I lower the window. <laughs> and he said, you cut me off twice. Blah, 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 blah. And I looked at him and I said, do you ever have one of those days where everything you do blows up in your face? Everything you do is wrong. And you're looking for someone to come over and shoot you and put you out of your misery. Are you the guy? <laughs> He goes, what? <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, said, I said, I don't cut people off in traffic. I don't cut them off twice. This is the worst day I've had in a long time. And I'm just 
I just think someone should put me out of my misery. Are you the guy? <laughs> and he looks at me, he says, calm down. I said, you calm <laughs> down. I said, you calm down. I don't do this. I don't <laughs> I don't cut people off. He said, no, it's going to be okay. I said, that's easy for you to say. You haven't had my day. And he said, no, no, really calm down. Take a breath. And I said, you calm down. And then, then he walks back over to his truck. He looks in the rear view mirror and he waves to me. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of there. <laughs> so that was being pretty quick on my feet. I have no idea where that came from. That's a, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> Okay, here's the OJ story. Sorry about it. Oh, so I, please, yeah. I, I worked at the prosecution. I was an advisor to the prosecution. And then I'm going to tell you about my story about discovering I was a racist. You'll like that one. Um, I will. I will. I will like that. And just to give context to some of our younger listeners, I mean, you guys probably know OJ from his Twitter account these days, which is so ironic you can hardly bear it. But uh, this was considered the trial of the century. And just to give an example, my mother on VHS tape recorded every day of the trial. So with that, go, go ahead, uh, Mark. Well, then, 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 so, um, I was working with the prosecution mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have off the wall interventions, you know, and, and, and actually, I had met with the district attorney, Gil Garcetti, who's the father of the mayor of Los Angeles. And, and I sort of knew him and I said, uh, you know, I, I don't really know much about trials, but seems to me if you're going to, you know, get a black jury, you might want to ask people, have they ever changed their mind about the way they felt about someone? Because mm -hmm. if they didn't change their mind about an abusive dad, they're not going to change their mind about O.J. Simpson. And then ask them, uh, what made you change your mind? Because, you know, you need jurors, if they're black, who are capable of changing their mind about O.J. Simpson and what would it take? Mm -hmm. And he went back to Marsha Clark and, uh, and the other. Uh, Chris Darden. Uh, well, Chris Darden came in later. This was uh, Bill Hodgman was the. Uh, original. Oh, I remember Bill Hodgman. Yes. Uh, Bill and I became friends. I got I to reach out to him. It's been a while. Uh, and he came back and he said, we never would have thought of that ever. I mean, ever. But as soon as you said it, you can see the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, uh, you know, if you want, you know, come to the trial. Uh, uh, might be interesting. And, uh, you know, when, when your schedule allows, come to the, you know. And so, you know, um, I, I was in the court room probably 20 times. Uh, mm -hmm. And what happened is in the middle of the trial, there was a fellow named Detective Mark Furman. Yes. And uh, and and F. Lee Bailey in open court uh, accused me of uh, medicating, drugging, doing something to him, because during the cross examination in the middle of the trial, Detective Furman came off as like a RoboCop. I mean, he came off as this, you know, strong, handsome, white dude. And mm -hmm. and and F. Lee Bailey wasn't able to break him in the middle of the trial. So I got subpoenaed to appear and I didn't do anything. You know, what I would do is I'd come in and I'd, you know, I'd have lunch with the uh uh the this district attorneys and 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 I'm someone who doesn't know how to leverage anything. I, I, I sent them probably 150 faxes. That could have been a book. Right. You know, never did anything with it. You know, you, here's something you, you know, you might try tomorrow, you know, you know, in the, uh, in the courtroom. And, and so I just give them these off the wall uh, uh, suggestions. And they said, we're keeping you out of the planning because you just don't think like any of us. And a lot of your stuff you come up with is crazy, but some of it is crazy. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, occasionally they'd say, you might want to watch the trial tomorrow. You might notice something. And so, uh, so F. Lee Bailey had accused me of somehow coaching or medicating or doing something with Detective Furman. And I get subpoenaed by Johnny Cochran. But I was in a building in 1994 that conveniently fell down in the earthquake. Mm. So my, my office went away and I never got the subpoena. 
So the subpoena wow. couldn't find me. And then the trial went on a couple of weeks and then, you know, you know, then they're on to something else. So at the end of the trial, though, there was a day when Detective Mark Furman took the Fifth Amendment because what, what had come out in the trial is that he had he had never said that he'd said the N word, but it turned out he said the N word a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And that came out in these tapes that were discovered later in the trial. And so there was a day when he took the Fifth Amendment. And I didn't know he took the Fifth Amendment because I was sequestered in the top floor of the criminal courts building in Los Angeles. Because if he didn't take the Fifth Amendment, they were going to pull me in and say, uh, you know, uh, he says he wasn't coached. He says he wasn't such and such. And I never I never did anything with him. I mean, you know, I never did anything with him. Uh, and so I didn't know he took the Fifth Amendment. And I started getting really nervous because what I realized is F. Lee Bailey was going to come and, and uh, interrogate me upstairs. Mm. So I had no idea what was going on. But I have this crazy mentality where I always do something that seems so far out of my reach that I get really scared, but I never panic. I get smarter. Mm-hmm. I think I've not, I think I have narcolepsy. I think because I, you know, I, I get bored by stuff, and then and then I'll say yes to something. Speaking in Russia, Russia, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, training FBI hostage negotiators. So I'm always reaching out for something to keep me alert. Mm -hmm. What happens is I'm there in the criminal courts building, September 5th, 1995. And I thought, oh, he's going to tear me to shreds. I don't know what's going on down there. Oh, maybe, maybe they're setting me up to be the fall guy. You know, you get paranoid. Right. And then then what happens about 5 p.m., I figure out, F. Lee Bailey and 80% of all difficult people in that one day. Mm. I realized, oh, he's going to charm me. He's going to frustrate me. He's going to anger me. And then he's going to outrage me. He's going to insult me because I've seen him do it. Yeah. And so when he comes in, I am so calm because I, I have him hot wired in my head. And so he sits down and I don't even look at him because I, I want him to just feel like I wanted to lull him into a false sense of confidence and, and I'm playing around with my books and whatever. And Bill Hodgman was with me and Bill says, Mark, Mr. Bailey's here to talk to you. And I said, Oh, oh okay, Bill. And then I looked, then I looked at uh, F. Lee Bailey, the way I looked into Nancy's eyes. Mm-hmm. And I see, I can look into your eyes right now and I can take them wherever I want. And I can look into your eyes with an open face. And I looked into his eyes and I grabbed onto his eyes and he said you know Dr. Goldston we don't really know what your role is here we know you've been here at different times during the trial and you know and and we know, uh, you know and we need to speak to you about your relationship with uh, Detective Furman and here's why I learned the power of innuendo because when someone makes statements instead of asking you questions they're expecting you to go huh uh-huh mm-hmm. uh-huh so when someone makes a statement, say, we understand you've been here at many times through the trial, the natural response is they go, uh-huh. But then they're pulling you in to outrage you mm-hmm. and then get you off balance. So knowing this, every time he made a statement, I looked at him looking into his eyes and I just blinked. Yeah. And after about five minutes, Bill Hodgman says, Mark, you haven't said a word because I didn't say, "Uh uh-huh. I didn't say anything. I just blinked. And I looked at Bill Hodgman and I said, he hasn't asked me a question. That's right. And I looked back at uh, Bailey and he sort of flinched like, you know, there may be something else going on with this guy. And then, uh, and then I knew he would do to me what he did in court. So he frustrated, you know, he wanted to frustrate me and anger me. And then he said, and then he reached the point, he said, so you're here to say that you never coached, you never medicated, you never did blah, 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 with Detective Mark Furman. So he's trying to push me, you know, outrage me. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking into his eyes. And there's about four other people in the room. And I can tell they're looking at me and everybody is waiting for me to say something. 
I count to seven and I go, <clears throat> and everybody leans in and I'm thinking, this is working really well. <laughs> so I, I count to seven again. And then, and then I reversed the innuendo. I said, Mr. Bailey. And he goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, and I've been looking in his eyes the whole time. I said, my mind wandered the last five minutes and it seemed important what you were saying. Could you repeat everything? <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me, eloquent, Effley Bailey. He said, what? I said, yeah, you my my... My car is parked in a locked lot, and I have no idea how I'm going to get out. And it's you know, 730. He goes, what? I said, it's, I said, it seemed important. Can you just say, you know, what it was? You know, because my mind wandered. And he looked at uh, Carl Douglas, who was one of the partners in Johnny Cochran's firm. And he basically said, what did I say? Because <laughs> when, when you provoke people, like, I won't talk about pol politicians we know, but when you provoke people... You never care what you say because you're getting them so off balance. Yeah. Uh, and then what happened is I said, uh, because it was like it was like David and Goliath. And I said, Mr. Bailey, he said, Yeah. I said, I'm not saying what you want me to say. Can you tell me what it is you want me to say? And if it's close to the truth, I will say it because I'm tired. But if it's not close to the truth, I'm going to have a problem with it. Hmm. And he looks at me like, what? And then, and then he says to Bill Hodgman, we don't have to ask him any questions, you know, because they could have called off seeing me because he took the Fifth Amendment. It didn't matter. I don't even know why, probably because he couldn't reach me in the middle of the trial. And then what happens is he gets up uh, to leave. And I say, uh, Mr. Bailey, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. and, and Bill Hodgman says to me, Mark, Mark, it's okay. It's okay. You know, it's the end of the trial. Okay, let's go. And I said, Bill, I've got it handled. I said, Mr. Bailey, uh, 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 remember when they said in the court that you can't unring the bell? Remember when uh, Carl, uh, uh, not Carl Douglas, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah who, who took over after Bill Hodgman? Uh, Chris Darden. Chris, Darden, when, yeah. Chris Darden said, uh, once they say the N-word, mm -hmm. can't unring a bell. Mm -hmm. Remember when that came out in the trial? He said, yeah. I said, you slurred me in front of the world. So in the newspapers, you know, that you, that you, you know, I was going to be sequestered today and, and you slurred me. Do, do you have any idea how we can unslur a slur? And he looks at Bill Hodgman like, what is this guy's problem? And by that time, Bill Hodgman goes, you know, he's on his own. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and with that, F. Lee Bailey just walks out of the room. And, and Bill says, Mark, it's okay. It's the end of the trial. And they misspelled your name everywhere. And I said, <laughs> and so what happens is uh, F. Lee Bailey comes back in. Uh, and he says to me, I'll trade you a retraction in tomorrow's newspaper if you tell me what you figured out about me. Wow. And at that point, I thought, no, nah, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because it's the end of the trial. And again, I wasn't there to make money, make a name for myself or something. I just, I thought this was going to be an interesting trial. And I, you know, I was glad to be part of it. Yeah, I think the remarkable thing about that trial that I remember, and this is totally looking at it retrospectively from 2020 vision, is that no one lost in that trial. No one lost, even the prosecution. They all wrote books. They all had bestsellers. Uh, I think Chris and Marsha had a love affair that brought them probably great joy and happiness. And well, if anybody lost, maybe it was, you know, the taxpayers uh, of of California, of Los Angeles County, and Nicole oh, no. Brown Simpson, oh, probably, right. but but the Goldman's won, OJ won, Johnny Cochran became a star, uh, Effley Bailey became a star. It, there were a lot of winners it, that came out of it, it even when really, they lost. It really hurt Chris Darden. I mean, Chris Darden, it it hurt. I mean, it changed really changed his changed his life. I think. Well, you know what? I'll I'll take a part of that back because I look at Darden and say, okay. 
what happened to him is different because here's a black guy trying to prosecute another black guy. Uh, yeah. So, so it, it, on the it, public stage. Yeah, and he and he's a good guy. But here's the the follow up. I'll tell you because I, when the not guilty verdict came in, um, I went to my black male friends and I said, "I'm sick to my stomach about this injustice." Uh, I mean. It's just so unjust. And, you know, all the blacks rejoiced and the whites thought this is an injustice. And I went to my black male friends and I said, uh, ever feel that way, that there's injustice in the world towards you? And they said, that's all I've ever felt. Mm -hmm. And I said, we're friends. Why didn't you tell me it was so bad? And each of them looked at me right in the eye and they said, because you didn't effing want to know. And it just knocked my head back. And I actually wrote an article called Outing My Inner Racist. Mm. And, and I became a uh, uh, a white co-host on a radio show that's still going called the Zo What Morning Show on Dash Radio. Mm-hmm. And we're like brothers, uh, Zo Williams. And... Uh, uh, Jeff Brown, great comedian, uh, uh, Corey Holcomb, some of the smartest people I know, black, white, or whatever. So I was Whitey Locks because I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I gave my son that that was my name on the show, and uh, I came up with it. Uh, but I, I just felt so upset with myself for being conveniently oblivious to the pain of my black friends. That's really well put, and. I think that we're we're working through that now, and I think there's there's a there's a scale to it that uh, people are becoming more aware of that that you couldn't really fathom. It's like when you unravel a conspiracy, you don't think the conspiracy can be real because it requires too much injustice and requires too much coordination. But then when you find out human beings are capable of that, it's almost like you, you were the victim of, of black magic, you know, in a way. And I've heard some really smart people talk about this, you know, listening to Sam Harris, who has a great podcast and app and talk about sort of the percentages. And, you know, one place I disagree with him is that, look, I'm a light skinned black guy. So I have it a little easier than I would say darker skinned blacks that I know. And I've had about five to 10 negative run-ins with the police where there was harassment and it was really obvious. We're not talking about perceived harassment, real stuff. And none of that is in the public record. So you could never go to data and then make some assumption about the statistics around black harassment or whatever, or even maybe even, well, with death currently for sure, but harassment, no way, because none of that stuff shows up in a record. If you don't get arrested, then there's no record. You just were, casually harassed for two hours and, and, you know, nothing, nothing happened. So I I think you, you're making a really wonderful point. So I'll leave you with an insight. Um, I wrote something about racism and white cops. And, and I, and, and again, uh, and I said that I think racism in white cops will continue. Hmm largely white male cops, you know, we're, we're really talking male. I mean, women just, women in our lives just want to get stuff done. Hmm. Males are the ones with the, a lot of the ego. But what I wrote about, and, I, and I'd like your thoughts and for you to sit with it, I said, one of the things that white uh, um, male cops do is they project the way they would feel if they were a black man. And they are convinced that if they were a black man being treated so poorly, that they would be angry. They would be Mm -hmm. pissed. So they're looking for any signs of anger, frustration. uh, And then in their minds, they preemptively say, oh, they're acting on it. They're reaching for something. I can protect myself. And when you talk to most blacks, I'm not angry at the cop. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to get myself right. killed. Yeah, I'm not angry at all. But I think until white people own that they're projecting onto black people what they would feel to be discriminated against and marginalized, 
and that they'd feel angry, it, it's not going to go away because that's what informs it. It's the projection. Oh, I know that black person's angry at me because that's how I would feel towards me. Oh, they're reaching for something. Uh, uh, so they're reaching for something to act on that anger. And, and it's very difficult, even not just within racial relationships, but even between husbands and wives. Yes. Yeah. We're all projecting all that time. And, and we're assuming that the other person is feeling the way we would feel if we were them. And, and, but that, that's, that's a whole other thing about realizing that we're all always projecting all the time and we need to be aware of it and just try to own the projections before they ruin our relationships. That's brilliantly put. And for those listening, are there any online resources off the top of your head or resources in general you can share that sort of touch on our holistic conversation around suicide prevention? If Is there anything you can think of where they can visit that online or on their cell phones? I would just say search Mark Goulston suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. You'll find all kinds of stuff. Gotcha. And can you share your socials or Twitter? I know you're big on Twitter. On uh, Twitter, your Instagram. Mark on Twitter, Instagram is small. Uh, LinkedIn is pretty up to date. On LinkedIn, I'm I'm actually listed as the world's leading healthy conflict coach. Wow. So what I now do is I don't do conflict resolution anymore because what I realized is when I would help people resolve conflicts. The bully would stay a bully after the conflict. Oh, okay. You know, and the bullied would stay bullied. So at my age, I'm not interested in doing that anymore. Uh, but what I will do is uh, coach people to be more, more healthy and effective in conflicts. So uh, because enormous amount of time and money, especially in entrepreneurial companies, is wasted because people are terrible at conflict. They either get angry or they avoid it. Mm -hmm. and, and both of those make it worse. So I can, and, and talking to crazy is a good book for that. So, you know, I, I can help anyone become more impactful. Well, you certainly helped me today and you've definitely helped this audience. Uh, you heard the man go to Twitter, go to Mark Goldston. You'll, he'll come right up. Uh, Instagram, the same thing, LinkedIn, you, you, you're going to find him. He's ubiquitous, nine, either authored or co-authored books, the great, great podcast. He has, uh, again, hundreds and hundreds of five-star reviews on my wake up call, wonderful podcast, wonderful conversation. And I really enjoyed this, Mark. Uh, I hope we get to do a round two and I know I'm going to talk to you offline. Absolutely. Now I look forward to that too. And, uh, uh, and also part of what I do at my age is I, I live to help people who are late 30s to early 50s land in their future. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, let's talk offline about doing that for you. I would love that. All right. And for anyone listening that wants to know more about what we do at the Make It Podcast, you can go to www.bonsai.film and you'll learn everything there. Dr. Mark Goldston, it's been a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Looking forward to that. Absolutely. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. Bye.